wow, what a question. How do I summarize that? Personally, I mean, this is going to sound super biased, but I wouldn't invest in a company that's not investing in our world's future. How can I give back? Then the other part of me goes, you've got to earn money before you can give back. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't see anything wrong with that image. <laughs> <laughs> if you want sales and you want to, you, you need to engage in the sustainability movement but authentically and properly, not through greenwashing or anything like that. Chris, I can't remember the exact country. It's lovely now. So, Rebecca Wolford, welcome to the Disenfranchised. How are you doing today? I'm really good. Thank you for having me. It's awesome to be here. Fantastic. And it's a, a real pleasure. And um, I think it's going to be quite a, an interesting conversation because um, you're a supplier to the franchise and industry, but slightly different to most of the others you know it's normally providing marketing or consultancy services or you know some software or something like this so uh, i'm interested to get into that but before we do um yeah. i'd like to to start off like i do with all with all of my guests and that's um to find out what your first job was in your career yeah so when i saw that question i thought do you mean off my first ever ever job or my first sort of career job um because I wasn't sure which one you meant because they're very different answers depending on what you what you say <laughs> I think whatever one you want to share really <laughs> <laughs> well, I can share both if you want um so it. if I I mean it depends how far back you want to go but if I go right really far back I think when I was around 13 years old which was a long time ago I worked in a sort of tomato factory setup and I was involved in making the boxes so um yeah very um very important very high level job that one um and I guess from a obviously not so far back first ever official kind of sort of career job um I was actually a, a sales manager in a sort of lead generation enterprise which okay. worked across the UK Barcelona the US in terms of inside sales, channel management, and that was all within the tech industry. So very different from what I do now, but yeah. So there's two answers for you there, Ed. So your, ver your very first one then in the tomato factory, yeah. that almost feels like, you know, in, con in connection with what you're doing now, very sort of in touch with nature, with, <laughs> with the tomatoes. I don't know, maybe yeah, I'm trying I to guess. <laughs> make a bit of a, a, a big leap. Loose, but... <laughs> loose connection there, but I see, kind of see where you're going. I'm trying I'm trying yeah. I think I got I think I got paid like 5p for every box um it was crazy and I, it was like one of those boxes you put together and it just almost cuts your hands because it's so harsh <laughs> it was a terrible job I didn't last very long I guess that's why kind of um it's all done by machinery that sort of thing nowadays exactly. though isn't it yeah, yeah no, exactly. I really enjoyed doing it and it's just quicker and easier to get a, a machine to do it. it'd be cheaper than five a box I'd imagine as well for them so uh but then that, see this is where the link comes in because that then has an impact on the environment in the long run right because you've got to run machinery and there's the yeah, connection right. <laughs> <laughs> anyway so kind of first proper job in your your career then was within that kind of uh sales lead generation environment um mm. was that something you you wanted to do because I saw you went to university as well didn't you so was that after university and is it the sort of career that you really wanted to get into or what was your kind of dreams at that point? No, it wasn't the career I wanted to go into. And I think I would say the majority, I don't know if you agree with me, Ed, but the majority of people that come out of university, whatever what degree they come out of, rarely get the job that they're looking for. Um, I guess unless you're wanting to become a doctor or something. But, you know, for me, it was very much just being totally open to, you know, sales runs through every aspect of every business. And I think if you've got a good, solid sales understanding, I really think it can support you through all the career choices you make from there. So I guess I just thought of it as a really good foundational piece. Um, and it was a really good culture there. You had people from all over the world. Uh, we had sort of 13, 14 different languages being spoken in the office as they were cool. working with lead generation all over the world. Um, and I and it, that diversity and culture was really exciting to be part of um, in the sort of early stages of my career. Excellent. And what, what sort of businesses was that working for? So tech, tech, company, tech companies, everything from Microsoft to lesser known ones like Hornbill or Shortel was a video conferencing one that people used to use. Okay. Um, so yeah, all the tech tech people you can think of, they worked within that industry. Awesome. So wh where did your career go from there then? Because that's obviously not where you, you've stayed and um, 
yeah, what, what kind of direction did you go into? Yeah, so uh, I was always very entrepreneurial at university, um, always had been, and came up with some ideas that I actually ran alongside my degree when it, at Exeter University. So after being part of the sales team uh, and that whole tech industry, um, I actually just went back to um, that sort of thing that you could just never ignore, that entrepreneurial spirit, and kind of went back there again. So it was full circle. Okay, um, and what, what, what did that look like then? What was, the, what, what was the business you started? Yeah, so it was actually a digital marketing agency, um, and I ended up running it with who, the guy who's now my husband, um, <clears throat> and we did that for many, many years. So, yeah, digital marketing in all aspects, from SEO to um, to web development right through to email marketing um, and a big focus on PPC pay, pay per me, uh, pay-per-click sorry cool and, and I imagine your kind of sales experience or the lead generation experience ties in quite nicely to that thing because there's always a battle I found over the years between sales and marketing teams right and they've got different opinions and and I've always kind of sat somewhere in between and, and I think it gives you a little bit of an advantage don't you think Absolutely, hands down, because your spot on is most people in marketing have only ever done marketing and most people in sales have only ever done sales. And you're absolutely right. There is usually this sort of lack of understanding or sometimes even conflict. So being able to have been in both spaces, you can really appreciate the other person's side and almost have, a, I guess, an empathy, uh, which is quite important for the other side um, and what they deal with. So, <clears throat> yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. It, it certainly helped me to have an understanding of both fantastic so um what happened to that business then did it did you sell it did it finish for whatever yeah, reason we, you know what we we actually finished it after after it was sort of seven eight years we we had done it um and it was pre-covid so this was a time when you had a we had people in the office and we would go every day it was based in bournemouth uh, around the south coast uh which Got, got a great beach great atmosphere and we had always wanted to travel and be a bit more flexible um, with our lifestyle and the agency had become very you know it was something that we had loved and enjoyed but we needed to close that chapter and move on um, and it, and it was a great decision because it freed up us to do other creative things that we'd wanted to do for years and years and years and I think that's the thing with businesses is every time you learn something new um, and then you can take that with you to the next project or whatever you decide to go and do so that's what we did fantastic so was the the next step entrepreneurial as well or, or did you go into employment yeah I was actually um headhunted by a franchise and I ended up being their head of content so um yeah so that's how my my journey started in the franchising world um which was super fascinating and fast-paced and and has been really interesting ever since and that's where I'm still now so uh, I must enjoy it <laughs> yeah so what did you think about the franchising industry before you joined did you have any awareness to it as a as, as to yeah, the kind of ins and outs or was it just like a lot of other people and it's the the big fast food brands and you know you need the big money to get involved in it for sure I was like everybody else that it was you know just like a food shop thing a mcdonald's thing over there it certainly wasn't um accessible by people that um as a choice outside you know losing a job redundancy those kind of things and an opportunity for the everyday person um i definitely didn't see it like that so it was a really fascinating world that you had to learn very very quickly um and yeah i i, it's, I, I was exactly like everybody else i had no idea the potential opportunity and I guess color and diversity that is actually in the franchising world. Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty um, eye opening, isn't it? Isn't it? As soon as you get into that world, you're like, oh wow, it's it is completely different, and there's no other way to kind of explain it other than um, a real eye opener going into that industry and experiencing the people that work within it, how they support each other. Like you say, the potential for um, changing people's lives as well as for 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 growth as well. It's uh, a really exciting industry to be a part of that's for sure but um what was the the, the name in the franchise brand that you you worked with uh the travel franchise so they're one of the fastest growing i believe um at least they claim to be <laughs> um, fastest growing within the uk um so yeah over 750 franchisees wow yeah is that in the uk mm -hmm. wow yeah i didn't realize that's 
that's a, that's, that's a massive number, isn't it, really? And um, I think that's that's the thing. Like, you see these brands on the high street or you engage with these people, you know, as a an, an individual business person, maybe, or you think they might be an independent, but actually they're part of this larger organisation where there's the support uh, and process been improved by the head office team um, mm. that you you don't see you know on that that kind of face to face interaction with or engaging with their service or their products. So yeah, that's yeah. that's a big surprise. But I didn't realise that. I'd a, heard of them a, before as well. <laughs> yeah, and that's a scale. You know, from I'm sure it is another franchise. It's not just that one. You've got people there, sort of one man band, maybe um, a working mum that wants something as a passion of her own on the side, right through up to. Um, someone that's created an office and has got an entire team behind them so you know you've got two ends of a polar but both within the same franchise um so yeah it, it attracts a certain in different different situations and setups um but it's not a high street brand uh interestingly despite having so many yeah definitely so uh, did that allow you to do the traveling that you wanted to do and get out there and see the world or were you absolutely yeah you did so so were you go into some of the potential locations and things like this or was that just you were working flexibly with them and I did go on to travel for many years actually um I lived in Slovenia uh, Croatia for a while uh, I lived all over um because I had the flexibility um ultimately you just need a wi-fi connection right but that wasn't directly through the franchise it was just my passion for travel that I'd had from when I was six when I first went traveling so yeah I, I did continue to travel but not directly through that franchise but they they allowed you to they, they were letting you work from home or you know work from wherever you want to basically yeah. oh, that's pretty cool yeah particularly when particularly when COVID came you know everybody just did that anyway I yeah. traveled all the way through COVID yeah oh really <laughs> yeah cool so um what 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 was the kind of things that you learned then from being part of that franchise and industry what was the some of the key things that you learned what were the key things that I learned? Wow, what a question. How do I summarize that when I've learned so much? Um, I would say the diversity of places where people come from, like I mentioned, um, I don't know if I mentioned, I, I was head of content. So my role was yeah. to extract some of all the best stories and you know, um, sort of bring that to the surface so people could feel inspired by other people's journeys. Um, that was at least part of my role and the you know speaking to I had the pleasure uh, of speaking to all these different people from all walks of life and then taking their story and making it into these videos or articles and I guess a big key learn was just from all the walks of life people come from so it might be a, a single mum who uh, kids had flown the nest and she wanted to finally do something for her. Um, other times I would speak to bankers that had been in the kind of wheel of working in, in central London for like 20 years and they were sick of their life and commute and had just packed it all in and had a uh, effort moment essentially I like to call it where they just yeah. went hey I, I'm gonna do I'm gonna do something for me so you had like bank the bankers coming forward then you had other people coming forward that were in maybe their mid-40s that suddenly had been made redundant and and it shook up every aspect of their life and they'd questioned everything and there was just such an age range as well and it was just that was a big key learn that, that there's no kind of set marker for someone to come to a franchise it can be really anybody from any situation and 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 walk of life and experience that has this I'm going to start my own business within a community that's going to support me because that's ultimately what a franchise is right yeah they just need to have that attitude don't they if you've got the right attitude and the desire to work hard you can build you can build whatever business you want to uh, knowing how to do it is the difficult thing and that's where franchising steps in right yeah, absolutely. And I guess the second key learn was I had read lots of stats and I wish I had the stat on me, Ed, but you probably know it because you're an expert in this space is um, the percentage of businesses that unfortunately fail within their first five years versus the percentage that actually succeed um, when they go through a franchise model and the likelihood of succeeding within a franchise model, it just tend to none yeah. really. Um, and therefore, you know all that risk associated all those concerns of starting a business suddenly feels better and more comfortable when you're starting a proven business you still have the flexibility and creativity to do your own thing 
but you have that opportunity to kind of not make costly mistakes all the time and 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 run with a proven recipe and I guess even though I kind of knew that when you go into the world and see how laid out it is for people it's almost this fast track road to success that franchising gives that starting a business by yourself just doesn't have as much um, yeah so yeah it's cool uh, the way you kind of described it there because it reminded me of a, a, a video project I worked on recently where I, I, was, I was doing a challenge with somebody. So I, I got them to build a brick wall and out of just a pile of Lego bricks, just stacked it up, said, right, now build the picture that's on one side of this Lego um, and, and do it as quickly as you can. I did it as well. But what I did is I laid out the bricks in a, a structured format so I knew which one to do next. Right. And it I did it in two minutes. They did it in 12 minutes and gave up. Right. And that's, mm. I thought that was a really nice um, kind of visual rep- representation of franchise and it exactly how you've described it there. So um, yeah, it's good to see that other people have that sort of same kind of uh, idea of what franchising is. But um, after the, the, the travel franchise, then um, where, where did you move on to? What, what was your kind of next step? Was it again, back into that entrepreneurship or did you stay within employment? So I I don't think you ever lose that entrepreneurial side within you. I I just, you you might stop focusing on things, but you never really lose it. And even when I was um, supporting that particular franchise, I was still had other projects bubbling away. And um, that was coming back to something I'd always been passionate about and had written about and done videos on YouTube about for many, many years. And that was all about my passion for nature Um, and engaging people in solutions that already exist for climate change. A lot of people think that we need this to come up with solutions. They already exist. They're already out there. We just need to engage people into them. So it was like trying to connect the dots with how do I engage that with what I'm already doing? And then the more and more I explored, I realized how much the franchise market hadn't sort of taken those steps within their own sustainability journey or engaging with the solutions of climate change, which we'll all face. Uh, and are facing already so that's kind of where I then started Kindbiz which is what I do today which is working with franchises with a proven framework essentially which helps franchises to engage in climate and social impact projects um, connecting all the dots giving them all the answers so there's no excuse not to engage in it basically (laughs) Fantastic. So I want to dig into that in a, in, a, in a second. But before I do, I wanted to ask you, where do you think your, your passion for, for nature, for the environment um, come from? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I've actually been reading more about this because it, it super interests me is that a lot of time people have difficulties in life. I mean, I mean, I always knew nature was there. I always knew it was there. I engaged in it. I hiked. I wild swam. I love it. However, a period of life that was very difficult for me. Um, you know, we all all go through different, you know, s- certain um, waves and troughs in our life, and t- certainly from a well-being and mental point of view, which is becoming more and more prominent for people now. Um, I sort of, I guess, you could, without it sounding cheesy, Ed, sort of turn to nature, and I read more and more about how um, nature supports depression. Um, it lowers our heart rate within 15 minutes of being in it. Um, it has so many positive effects for us uh, with, you know, just being around nature. And that's why we've got to protect it. And my passion sort of was fueled from that and that sort of healing process, if you like. And I just kind of realised suddenly how powerful nature is and how connected we are to it. We think we're disconnected and sort of this separate entity, but really we're super connected to it and all the natural systems we get, the air we breathe, the water we drink, everything. And yeah, so it kind of came from a place of a bit of pain and difficulty. And then I just had this connection that I've had ever since. And I guess almost a commitment that I was gonna make sure every day that I was here, I was gonna kind of support it as best I could in any way I could using the skills I had. And that commitment has not stopped ever since then, so. That's quite a long-winded way of answering your question. <laughs> no, that's cool. It's really good. And it, it reminds me of a, um, a period in my life. So I was um, working on a, on a high street with a recruitment company. And I was living literally at the other end of the high street. Um, and my commute every morning was a walk 
into town, which was nice. You know, I could grab a coffee, grab a bacon sandwich and didn't have to wake up too early. And at the end of the day or at the end of the week, whatever, you know, go for a beer and, you know, I didn't have to worry about driving at all. And, and that was that was great for a while. But um, there was other sort of stuff going on in my world at the same time. And I was starting to get really kind of heavy shoulders and, and not enjoying myself. And I then decided to, to, to fix my health as well because I was put on a few pounds and stuff like that. And I went on a bike ride with one of my friends and I just remember seeing this crow on a, a, a gate post or fence post. And I was just like, wow, look at that. Isn't it just amazing? And it sounds like really kind of hippie and weird, doesn't it? But I think it no, was not my, at all. my moment where I was like, why have I shut myself off from nature for so long? You know, I've because uh, for, for a couple of years, I wasn't doing any form of exercise. So I wasn't really going out and about and stuff like this. But as soon as I did, I got out into the fields and started to see nature properly. I was like, yeah, I, I didn't realize how much I love it and want to engage in this world. So I can yeah. relate to what you're, you're saying there really well. I, I perhaps haven't taken it as far as you have yet. Um, but um, yeah, I guess that's what we're going to talk about next really is uh, kind biz then. So um, talk me through kind of the, the, the challenge in sort of setting up this business and the kind of what's the main problem that you're trying to solve with it? Yeah, so the main problems really, which I identified, I, I'm going to not obviously talk about the franchise, but I think this is businesses wider than the franchise, yeah. is that majority of business owners want to do the right thing. Uh, they want to, they understand they need to be part of this movement, this solutions, because if they don't engage, they will be left behind anyway, because it will happen. Um, and they just don't know how to start, where to start they're worried about making the wrong decision. So which environmental partners would we connect with? How would it work? How do we set the processes? How do I engage my heads of department in such a thing? Because it's a cultural shift that has to happen a lot of the time. You know, all these questions, and it just seems like too much of an elephant in the room to sort of, and people sort of pretend it's not there and therefore don't take action. And I'm trying to solve the problem simply, which is, Getting these environmental projects are critical um, to part of solving the climate pros, um, climate change problem, but also a social, you know, the social aspect and com connecting communities and people to nature in any way, which there's some incredible initiatives out there doing that, particularly in cities. And it's a, how do we pull those pieces together? We've got businesses that want to do the right thing, but don't know how. And we've got incredible initiatives going on under, over here that are underfunded and need support. And yeah. how can we connect the two? Um, so ultimately, I kind of am the person in the middle, sort of making that flow of energy and interaction happen. Um, and I actually would love to do just a quote something, if I may, Ed. Yeah, sure. Um, Go for it. Which is... I read in a report that just 4% of the money from UK uh, trusts, foundations, charities, all across the UK is actually reported to go to environmental causes, including climate change, just wow. 4%. And that shows you what a gap that there is there. Um, and therefore, you know, the Greta's of this world, God bless her, she's amazing, um, you know, igniting people, but we also need people um, within the business level to actually start driving this change. Um, because I think if you don't have a partner to handhold you through that, it's so much easier to ignore it versus actually take action. Why do you think businesses want to take action then? Because my, my experience of, you know, CEOs of large companies is if they want something to happen, they find a way to make it happen, right? So yeah. why, why do they want to get involved or why do they feel they should get involved and not actually follow through? Mm. Well, I think that um, it's difficult running a business, whether it's big or small. And I think that everybody's juggling a million balls and it's really hard to keep them all in the air. And this one can feel like another one that you're trying to do. Um, I think that we're all very different human beings from different experiences and situations that have shaped us. And therefore, just because nature is super important to me doesn't mean that it's at the forefront of their mind every day. So it's like, how do we make that shift? A bit like when you were enjoying your beers and baking sandwich versus when you saw the crow, you had that shift of, oh, actually, 
nature is there and I and I do feel this connection to it um, so it's kind of reminding them on that so they maybe have lost connection because they're so busy and they're just going through the humdrum of life that they've completely <laughs> forgot yeah. about it so there's there's that aspect um, there's also fears and costs obviously costs of what yeah. this is going to involve hiring somebody internally we take that all away all those worries and um, yeah I guess I, th I think more than ever the, the momentum is building you know you can't not go on tv and see it mentioned you know the the fridays for futures being an amazing movement for school kids etc so they, they, they know they can't ignore it um i just think it's it's really coming to a head now to be honest ed um within that space but there's such a myriad of reasons why people aren't started to take action some people have taken a few steps but then they kind of lost their way yeah. so it's so many different situations it's hard to summarize I, th I, th I think a big part of it from from my experience and just speaking to people about this, um, the reason I was speaking to people around this kind of sustainability piece is because the company I used to work for, Expense Reduction Analysts, used to help companies to um, become more efficient ultimately. And through that, mm. there was a positive carbon impact maybe or, or, or something along those lines that was, sorry, a negative carbon impact but in a positive way if you see what I mean um so I, I got into a few conversations around it but I think it's the time and money factor of things a lot of businesses um they're focused on growing their profitability ultimately at the end of the day and trying to do something for the environment it feels like okay we could give five percent or whatever percentage they want to give to 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 charity but like you say it's who and where and that then takes a lot of time to do that investigation and in the meantime they've got supply chain issues brought on by covid or whatever it may be and so they're going mm -hmm. kind of going well that's screaming louder than this right now yeah, um right. and that's why they don't go down that route so i guess what you're provide you're saying you're providing is you're kind of taking that off their hands for them and showing them the kind of path forwards to make it a lot easier which i think's pretty cool yeah yeah, that and integrating it in what they already do. You know, this isn't about it being a separate arm to the business. Every time they win as a business, whether that's in a sale or whatever it is that they do, that they that the planet wins. And it's that win-win that we're trying to create. And it and it's part, becomes part of my client's culture um, through the content and the compelling stories we share on a weekly, monthly basis, as opposed to just this tick box over here you know, that we're not going to pay too much attention to. We, we actually approach it very differently and integrate it to all heads of department, train up everybody, make sure everybody's on board, understand its importance. And it's funny that you say, Ed, because you're absolutely spot on that companies think time and money. Yes, that's what we must, but we've got to focus on this, these urgent things, therefore that's not important. The truth is when businesses focus on community and social environmental projects, actually all the stuff that's causing this pain over here is answered and what i mean by that is companies are engaged in environmental social projects see increases in franchisee recruitment increases on morale of their actual internal team people feel like they have more purpose it's not just about profit and um, there are hundreds of reports out there just google Google did a report on it, in fact, the amount of consumers that are now leaning towards companies that are part of these environmental movement and actually leaning away from people, uh, companies that are not part of this movement. And all this is wrapped up in actually just doing the right thing. So it's not only the right thing for the planet and the right thing morally, but it's the right thing for the business. And all these benefits start following and CEOs sort of wake up and go, oh yeah, actually look at all these benefits of doing the right thing. And it's like this light bulb moment. It's all connected, just like in nature. Everything's connected. Yeah, um, it's, 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 it is interesting because I've, I'm trying to think of any sort of scenarios in my own life where I actually do that. And um, I've, I've realised I've spoken to a few people about um, a particular brand of chocolate bar lately. <laughs> I don't know how we've gotten these conversations. Maybe like Tony's. Chocolate, Tony's yeah, chocolate? Tony's Chocoloni, yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> and I've mentioned it now to a few people saying, oh, and as a bonus, you know, they, they, they're trying to um, do good for the environment and, you know, um, uh, trying to minimise kind of slave trade and, and things like that. And um, people are like, oh, that's great. Yeah, that's even better then. And it, I guess it's the same for any business, isn't it, really? And, okay, it might not be the, 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 the main selling point, but it is a differentiator from the companies that aren't doing Massively. those kind of things. And 
um yeah if we're doing that on cut such a base level as chocolate bars you know the same thing is going to be happening at, at a business level as well isn't it completely i mean for example the travel franchise which i've shared with you ed uh, one of the case studies is that you know, I couldn't have foreseen the, the amount of feedback that we were getting from franchisees saying that they were getting new business partnerships because people were saying, oh, you're working with Climate Hero Projects. One lady had someone physically run up to her at the back of a networking event and say, I'm going to book all my holidays with you going forward because of what you're doing within the Climate Heroes. The power of it is unbelievable. And your, your example of Tony's is absolutely spot on. We don't buy any other chocolate but Tony's now, totally eradicating slavery within the chocolate market. How is that still happening in 2022? Yeah. But they are the only chocolate company that's actually gone out there and said, we're drawing a line in the sand. Cadbury's, all those guys didn't take the opportunity despite them having millions of billions of pounds behind them. Yet this Tony guy comes up and says, hey, this shouldn't be happening. And that power of doing the right thing is shakes up the rest of these chocolate companies are going, oh, damn it, we should have been doing the right thing from the beginning. <laughs> you know it I mean? helps their chocolate is amazing, by the way. It is unbelievable. <laughs> it is. You're absolutely right. The product has got to be good. If the product's so good, obviously, yeah, but it's, um, it is truly amazing to see the ripple effect happening within the franchises that we're working with for their franchisees to feel more purposeful in their daily goings they just feel more alive with what they're doing they feel part of a bigger purpose yeah it's it's super exciting so why are you personally focusing on the franchising industry then you know from um all the businesses out there you could be you could kind of aim pretty wide and try and have a big impact across mm -hmm. any industry any sector that you want to why kind of narrow your focus in on the, the franchising industry yeah it's a great question i mean the franchise by default is if you get in at the top and get connected, it flows down to hundreds of other businesses. Um, I would be dead before I could connect with all of those. Um, there's so many of them. Therefore, it's this all sort of filtration, very scalable, quick way of making the impact as big as possible towards these environmental projects. And that's ultimately what was at the forefront of everything I wanted to do and why Kind Biz came up. It was just this realization that there's such a lack of funding, as I mentioned, that 4%. Um, and therefore, how do we get as many, you know, I could go to individual small business owners, but we would not be getting the funding that was needed to turn the tide as quickly as possible on climate change and biodiversity loss. So the franchise model served to that, if that makes sense, that as quickly, you know, as scalable as possible as it is. And secondly, the franchise market felt like it was quite behind, if I can say, in terms of actually making yeah. some positive movements. And I really enjoy the franchise world. I, I'm like you, Ed. I, I, I've seen such beauty come out of play, places of pain for people, redundancy, losing members of family, deciding to change their entire life and just having this amazing moment where they can enjoy a community that is all about opportunity and supporting each other. So I think the franchise market is just a wonderful place to be a part of. So yeah, lots of reasons why I approach the franchise market. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, so you said something there that um, kind of almost answered a question I was going to ask. And that was, uh, so I, I kind of try and aim this podcast towards people that are exploring the franchise and industry and trying to understand a bit more about it and, and the brands within it. And I try and think of things from their perspective, right? So why is this interesting to somebody who might invest in a franchise license? And I think you've answered one, you know, if you're the network you're joining um, offers, you, you know, some, some sort of project that you can get into from day one, that could in turn have uh, knock on effects in terms of developing business or finding projects that you can work on with, with other clients that are working with a similar charity, maybe. Um, but yeah, are, are there any other things that you think are really in, useful for a, fran a potential franchisee to understand about what you're doing or what could they look out for maybe in a brand? I'm throwing a few questions at you here because I'm just yeah. trying to look at it from their perspective, maybe. Yeah, for sure. I, I see what you mean. So I think personally, I mean, this is going to sound super biased, but I wouldn't invest in a company that's not investing in our world's future. I just think it's as simple as that. And if there's some franchises you're looking at, ask them the question. 
you know, what is your sustainability plan? How are you engaging this? If you're not, why not? Um, because there are businesses that are doing that. And I think if we all ask the question, I'm not asking you to go out on the streets and <laughs> start, start parading your, your, the message of climate change. What I'm saying is if we can just ask the question with every purchase we make, and that comes back to a franchise. I think anybody listening today, if you're thinking about purchasing a franchise, you know, look, ask those questions because it, it says a lot about a culture as well of a franchise, as in not necessarily even engaging with um, the environment, but social projects you know, those kind of thing, community projects. This is a lot about a franchise based on whether they're engaged in those kind of things. So my advice would be to look out for that and question it if it's not the case. Because even if you just get a head of sales or CEO thinking, yeah, why aren't we doing that? You've probably sparked positive change just by asking it. Um, and you mentioned that around, you know, franchises from day one, right? I'm working through with franchises from their first week within the business right through to ones that have been going for over seven years, 10 years. And both of them are reporting back differentiators, new fresh messaging, all that good stuff that does help them stand out, whether that is the travel industry, which is really competitive or another industry that's super competitive. Um, you know, how are you gonna stand out? How are you gonna show that you're not just about profit, but you've got purpose? And that's what wins these days, um, you know. I, and so, yeah, I would ask the question would be my suggestion. See, now I'm, I'm now thinking of it from my perspective as a small business owner, right? So I've started my own business and I've always had it in my mind. I want to do something around sustainability with my business. And I know we've, we've spoken already about starting that journey together. Um, but yeah, if, if we hadn't sort of crossed paths, I'm not sure if I'd be still worrying about putting energy into it because when you're starting your business mm. you're kind of always thinking ah, where's next month's money coming from is this the right model am I able to create it I guess if you're joining a franchise business that's already got that in place that's another worry off your hand which Completely. um yeah because I do I do I do think about it all the time I think you know what can what how can I give back I guess is always what mm. I'm trying to think of but then the other part of me goes you've got to earn money before you can give back. <laughs> but you, you, you we, I, as you've already explained, there's ways around around that without it having to, to negatively impact the profit of your business, I guess, which is, um, which is really cool. So, um, it's all, and it's all connected. It's not, yeah, it's not, it's not ignoring the profit. It's actually realizing that it's all connected. You can still make, I mean, just, I, my advice would be to go to Google Google's um, reports. I'll, I'll share the link with you, Ed, but see what they're saying about consumer stats or just Google in terms of increased sales. You know, even if you don't have that environmental pursuit or, or connection to nature, as I described today and you described Ed, you know, just look at the evidence, what Deloitte's saying, what Smart Energy's just reported on. If you want sales and you want to, you, you need to engage in the sustainability movement, but authentically and properly, not through greenwashing yeah. or anything like that. And, you know, you, people will know whether it's authentic or not. They won't need to be sustainability experts or have a degree. They'll know whether it's authentic or not. Um, so, yeah, it's all connected. You want increased sales profitability, you better start thinking about how you're going to be part of the bigger purpose within our world, because that's what consumers are leaning towards now. Yeah. And actually, you say now, um, I, 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 just a, a memory has come to my head. So when I worked in recruitment, um, probably about, it must have been eight years, nine years ago, something like this. I remember we were putting a tender together to work with a company like InterServe or something like this to, to, to provide them with temporary staff. And um, they were asking about the social corporate responsibility. What are you doing for the environment? You know, is your business carbon neutral? All of these, these, mm -hmm. these good things. And um, as a as a recruitment company, we were like, oh, yeah, we're we're not sure if we we've got anything to offer here at that point in time. I remember the head office had stacks of paper everywhere, and they're printing out everything constantly, and and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, is a fire hazard, really. But um, yeah, they the, when the feedback came back as to why we didn't get um, the the contract, it was because the other company. I, 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 there was not nothing to really differentiate us other than that social um corporate responsibility you know and uh, yeah it just makes sense doesn't yeah. it so um I, I wondered if you can give give us kind of like a um a kind of example maybe so let's say um franchise brand 30 franchisees 
you know, what, what sort of projects could you help them to get involved with? Yeah, so we've got, uh, it's always ever evolving, but we've got three main themes. So the first one is um, climate heroes. We call them climate heroes. Uh, they're, for, they're from nature. They're not some wow Japanese tech thing. It's <laughs> actual nature. So climate heroes are incredible things that have been working for millions of years uh, that we've just been ignoring. So, for example, whether that's kelp, uh, which is seaweed, uh, we, we call them blue forests or marine forests. Uh, they can lock up carbon up to 30 times faster than trees. And I work with some of my clients to restore uh, across Europe kelp that has been degraded through whether pollution or overfishing. And those forests are super important for keeping the water clean, but also uh, locking away carbon, which is super important and supporting fish species. So that's uh, the climate heroes and the climate heroes can also be something as small and as fascinating as termites so um, we're supporting uh, critically underfunded research in Africa where we're learning how termites actually mitigate drought so as we know drought has been really yeah. having a huge problem in Africa uh, particularly and termites are actually proving to mitigate that drought to actually slow it down um, restore the soils retain the water better so all those kind of things they're all climate heroes that are supporting not only looking at carbon but helping us to deal with drought flooding you know that's already happening because of climate change so they're the climate heroes then we've got another theme which is focused on rewilding. So I don't know if you knew this, Ed, but um, we're sort of the bottom 20 out of all the countries. The UK is in sort of the bottom 20, I believe now, for diversity and nature. You know, that's how poor our nature setup is now. So yeah. we focus on rewilding projects like can be everything from bug to beavers um, I could talk for another hour Ed about beavers and their incredible um, they're ecosystem engineers and they mitigate they stop flooding literally in its tracks but they also help the land to hold water through times of drought and they literally have been described by scientists to breathe life back into the land incredible species that follow when you reintroduce reintroduce beavers so that's just one example of what we call rewilding and yeah. the third I, I was just I was going to say beavers I didn't even really realize that they were in this country until I took a trip down to Devon and yeah. near our campsite there was a beaver in in the area and I was like what really awesome so <laughs> um they saw it as a bit of a pest but they did get involved with the environment oh, environmental agency and things like that well they're all of the trees they're just <laughs> chewing them down and causing damage to the the, the plants yeah. so you know the campsite owner is a farmer um yeah sorry it's maybe it's a bit of a pest but knew they're probably a, a protected species in the country so they didn't engage with the environmental yeah. agency and they've come out and they were starting to do all their kind of research and setting up cameras and all that sort of oh, stuff oh that's but, awesome but yeah i, I didn't yeah, realize no, they they we used to have them beavers used to be all over the uk and it was actually us humans that hunted them to extinction but they used to run through all the rivers in the UK and they're such an important part of the ecosystem. They're what we call a keystone species. So they're amazing. I can only recommend reading about the incredible case studies of how um, beavers are changing landscapes for better, rewilding the rivers. Um, but I bet you that campsite owner, if he, that beaver wasn't there, he would have more problems of floods and drought on his land. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, so that was the second one, and the third one's communities rising, and that's all, where, all. That's really focusing on how climate change is really deeply entwined with inequality. The most vulnerable people bear the brunt of it, and from city tree projects to climate refugees, communities rising is that other social aspect that can't be ignored in any conversation about uh, climate change. So yeah, they're the three themes, and um, your question was how. Do co companies engage with that? Well, simply we engage with the franchisee franchisors, and it, that flows down to the franchisees. So, if you are in a franchise and you're not doing that, then you know that's a way that they could engage with it. And like I said, you know, if you're planning to invest, ask the question, ask whether they're engaged in it, and if they're not, then you know, tell them there's solutions out there. Fantastic. 
So I'm conscious of time now. So I'm going to move on to uh, my final three questions, um, yeah, okay. which you've told me you've prepared for. So I'm looking forward to some amazing answers from these ones. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> but uh, the, the first one is um, what funny, weird uh, or strange stories have you had in your career? What's What's been the best one? I found this really hard to answer actually. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna go for this one. It, it might be funny, it might not be. Um, I thought it was funny. So um I a long, long time ago, sort of during my university years, I actually worked for Limewood Spa. Have you heard of them? They're in no. the New Forest. Yeah, they're they're a sort of celebrity elite hangout spa place that's why i, I haven't felt, heard of them yeah, yeah right <laughs> i felt totally out of place working there completely out of place um it was really a billionaire's playground anyway um i was part of the spa management team there and i would have to go in at sometimes 4 a.m um when no no guests were there so i, I found it completely pointless um 4 a.m and i used to just basically you know just sit there and to wait for a customer to turn up anyway they had this yeah they had this ridiculous policy where you had to park really far down the car the um because it's across the new forest really far down away from the spa it was probably about a 20 minute walk and there was no proper lights that went up not at 4 a.m <laughs> anyway and i had a rusty old nissan micra and i would have to part at down the end and walk up at 4 a.m by myself unlock everything nobody around so I was like that is a ridiculous rule so I would drive up and park in the the guest car park right and I did this for a number of weeks thinking I got away with it anyway one day management called me in and they brought up this CCTV and I thought okay that's of the car park and they sat me down and they said um do do you see anything wrong with this image and essentially what I was looking at is you can't imagine the car that you had Maseratis, you had Ferraris, <laughs> you had blackened out windows, you had probably about 50 cars that looked like they were the elite. And you had right in the middle, this rusty Nissan Micra. <laughs> and I looked at it and I went, no, I don't, I don't see anything wrong with that image at all. <laughs> anyway, I got, I got in trouble. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's that's amazing! Like, yeah, just that's a billionaire who has a Nissan Micro. Why not? <laughs> yeah, I was like, no, I don't know. They and 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 I and I actually was like trying to obviously play along because I just thought it was hilarious. And um, and then they pulled up some other footage of me going in and out of the car at lunch. So they knew exactly that I knew that. And it was just I was sort of like stretching out in the sun by my car, and they had all these Ferraris. <laughs> Brilliant! Me. I love it. <laughs> yeah I didn't I didn't last there very long but yeah that was the, the only funny story I could think of <laughs> no that's cool I like that one but um the, the next question then is what's been your proudest or most inspiring moment in your career oh, proudest um I guess the proudest was launching kind biz and launch and sort of my first ever time that I launched it within a franchise and just seeing the reactions of people that you know the response was just you know presenting these climate heroes and projects and saying this is what we're now going to do this is something your business can be part of you know it was super emotional because I'd worked really hard to get to that point it had been a quite a long and difficult journey as it always is anything worth having is quite quite difficult right and yeah. I remember presenting it to these businesses and the, and the feedback I got was just people saying you know I've been waiting years for the franchise to do something like this you know I've always wanted to engage I was starting to have people coming forward saying I studied climatology at university but I never ended up going into it you know the fact that I can now be part of this for my business as well you know I, I would say that's a moment that has really stood out to me I felt super proud to have been part of something like that and and uh, I guess I still am today yeah no that's really good that's really cool so um final question then and I, I guess we've kind of already broached it a little bit but um I guess you can tap in some other kind of viewpoints from your time working within a franchise but um I wondered if you were speaking to somebody who is um potentially about to invest in a franchise what what would be the one piece of advice that you'd give to them yeah the one piece of advice would be uh to have a mentor so we're I don't know if you know Marie Folio, uh, but she is an incredible 
entrepreneur that I, I listen to. But anyway, she says we're, we're social creatures. Community and connection are oxygen for us, basically. And ultimately, what you don't want to do as a business owner, whether you're engaging the franchise or going alone, you don't want to reinvent the wheel and you don't want to make costly mistakes um, and you want to avoid them. And by having a mentor, it can really help you focus efforts, um, focus your goals and obviously get that valuable feedback that's super important. Obviously, it's important. It's someone that you trust. But having a mentor, I'd say, is absolutely critical in starting a business and if it's not physically that you can't get a mentor then uh, you know a virtual one for instance if there's a really good podcast that you actually get huge amounts of value from so Marie for Leo is one for me best entrepreneurial podcast out there who ties in well-being and nature and all sorts you know that that would be my top advice is get a mentor ideally physically but if not then then virtual and and if not through zoom then then maybe a podcast or something but i'd say mentorship i've realized over the years and different businesses i've done is is super important just have somebody to keep in check to bounce ideas off um is is super important yep no that's a good point and and actually i i think you'll find them in a lot of franchise networks right it it could be the franchise or themselves or or one of their team uh depending on the size of the organization of course um, or it could just be the fran- another franchisee who's more experienced. So uh, just to, to put in a few other ideas of where you can find fran- uh, you know, mentors um, outside of that kind of external business, or the, the usual business world, I guess. So, um, Rebecca, thank you very much for um, your time today. It's been really interesting speaking with you and hearing your story and, and learning a bit more about KindBiz. So, uh, yeah, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for having me, Ed. It's been awesome fun. Real pleasure. Take care now, Rebecca. Bye.